Uh, hi there. Amir Shafai from Natural Resource Governance Institute. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it comes to the issue that was discussed towards the end on the beneficial ownership registry. I think many of us recognize that the UK, and for that matter, the EU, is, really has shown a, a level of thought leadership on this issue, and the issue has, has moved dramatically. I mean, when I heard this issue the first time I joined the precedent predecessor organization for NRGI from corporate law practice, and we heard about this idea that Global Witness and others had worked on quite a bit, beneficial ownership, I thought it was a non-starter. And here we are, the UK, the EU is committed to it. I think part of what Maya has raised, this issue of whether it's um, the solutions actually work, whether the information that's out there can actually be used. Mm. Recently, we had the disclosures under UK EITI. Okay, report. so d just so we don't get too Very technical, quickly. Uh, uh, is there a question that you'd yeah. like to remember? I'd like to see how we're going to actually um, make this work. Because the most recent UK EITI, or the first UK EITI report, of all the companies that were supposed to disclose, yeah. only one disclosed. The threshold for disclosures is 25% ownership. Are we actually creating a net that okay. catches what we're looking for is the question. All right, so we've got another question here. And if there's more on that side of the room, let me tempt out somebody else. Hi, I'm Barry Johnston from ActionAid, ex of ChristianAid. Firstly, um, I think um, Vince was a little bit um, modest uh, in his, his summary previously. Where we got to one public beneficial ownership wouldn't have happened without, without him at Cabinet. And I'm sure he's, it just slipped his mind, all the work that Christian Aid and Action Aid did to support him alongside Global Witness as well. Um, and I think coming up to this summit, we, we, we miss him around the Cabinet table with the decisions that are being made uh, at the moment. Uh, the, my question is, could a lot of people talk about the legitimate stuff that's happening in these tax havens. Could you give some examples? And I kind of, when I say legitimate, more mean economic, economically useful and productive. Okay. All right. Is there a final one? Just let me stick to this side. I'll come to the, the rest of the room. Yeah. Hi. My name is Ahmed Dezaz. I'm from Cardiff Met University. Uh, I'm from Pakistan, actually, and our prime minister is currently involved in this scenario as well. Uh, my question is, like, uh, how it decide, like, when they decide to leak something or it's been decided that because some of the information we already have knew, we have seen some documentary on BBC uh, covering this corruption scandal involved the PM of Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, and so on. I read the case of Harry Redknapp and he's the manager of Tottenham Hotspur that something involved in that thing. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. so, what, so what's your question? The question is that the information is some of the information was already leaked. So what is the point that it is just a mask, or is it about the timing of the when they decide to leak, or is it's like a political motive behind this? You think there's a, there may be some political motive behind yes. the leaking of the, yeah. the Panama Papers. So, so Vince, do you want to just take uh, definitely the beneficial um, ownership thing? Interesting to hear your response on the the legitimate stuff on tax ha havens as well. Yeah. Uh, well, on, on, I'm, I'm starting to be corrected, but my understanding is that most of the EU countries have established registers, but they're not open. Is that, that I think that's the case. That, that, yeah, other than the Netherlands. Yeah, they, do, they don't want them to be open, so there is a difference. I think the, the, the EITI is an interesting one. We had a long battle about this with, with the companies arguing that once you start demanding high levels of granularity, uh, in these contract disclosures, uh, you, you, you're actually um, effectively making the business inoperable because you're revealing you know, details of a perfectly legitimate commercial work that, that you shouldn't. And um, the big argument with the NGOs was that they wanted project level uh, disclosure and we finished up with with much more broad brush, which would explain why relatively few disclosures have actually been made. And I, I think this is probably an issue to go back to um, mm -hmm. and, you know, getting, I think that was a very helpful intervention. Uh, I, I genuinely have mixed feelings about these um, tax havens. I mean, you, you, you just thought, well, why are they there other than to... <laughs> Um, you know, stop our government and the American government, the German government, and the African governments getting their tax rate. Why, why do they exist? And I, I can't think of any terribly good reason, actually. But but the problem is, what what do you then do about it? Um, 
you know, the, the gunboat diplomacy isn't terribly applicable. And, of course, the, the problem is that all the major Western countries behave like tax havens. I mean, we're, we're in a kind of corporate tax bidding war at the moment. And, you know, I've often used to joke about Liechtenstein on Thames. You know, we, 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 you know we, we're, we're part of this process where we're trying to undercut Ireland and Ireland's trying to undercut mm -hmm. Luxembourg. And, and, you know, once you're in that game, pointing a finger at Guernsey or the Isle of Man or the Cayman Islands, well, you know, we're all in that business together. And, and the only way of ultimately stopping it is to have much higher levels of tax harmonisation. But as we know from the EU debates, that's, you know, just absolutely taboo. So I'm afraid I haven't got any helpful and suggestions other than acknowledging quickly, the seriousness of the problem. You yeah. talked, uh, and several have talked here about the UK being a leader, but can it be a leader on its own? Really, how much are people in behind the UK's action on this? Well, I, th I think it's true to say that, that at European level there is a wish to do things in this space, but that they, they haven't followed the British transparency for good or really bad reason, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's, 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 I think the OECD is actually quite an important vehicle because they're in, in a sort of quiet way, I mean, they've got us a lot further on the road in terms of overseas corruption legislation, and they are the people who actually monitor uh, tax havens and they give them status. I think it's slightly uh, unfortunate language about white versus black uh, in terms of their their quality. Uh, but I mean that that's the kind of in a way the best vehicle we have for monitoring these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I just bring in um, just uh, John and David um, at this point as well to to answer some of those questions? John, perhaps you could pick up this point of. You know, are we doing the right things here in the UK, taking a lead on beneficial ownership? Do you think that that, that is important, or what other kind of action would you like to see? <clears throat> no, I, 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 I followed very closely uh, the you know, trade, tax, and transparency work that was led by the UK government in 2012 and you know I, I got a sense that you know geopolitics crimea syria etc sort of distracted attention from that i think i think it's i think that was definitely a move in in the in the right direction and uh you know i hear of, of a conference that is coming up and i hope that that kind of momentum can be uh can be picked up and you know the discussions that we've been having uh, in, in, in developing countries and with colleagues also in the United States, another in, in, in anti-corruption fraternity, is um, we require a mechanism, uh, whether it is like you know, the UN weapons inspectors, but a mechan an international mechanism that allows um, the interrogation of entities that, that have form. Uh, and, and, you know, when you study uh, these entities that are involved in the, you know, the, uh, the mispricing, the, you know, and, and these days they, ov they overlap in terms of, you know, money laundering, um, the movement of illicit proceeds, terrorism proceeds, etc. They, they have, you know, they have certain characteristics. Uh, when I, when, 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 if I'm in DRC, if I'm in Kenya, in Tanzania, they have certain characteristics that are beginning to to come together. You know, they'll favour the, the the secrecy, especially around beneficial uh, ownership. Um, they will make very early use uh, of 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 you know of of the very best uh, in the service sectors, the lawyers, the auditors, and the bankers, but with a very light touch. So these are not parties necessarily at the beginning who are well established but these are briefcase individuals who meet in in uh, um, in, in, in in the lobbies of the best hotels in Kinshasa and Nairobi etc and and put together the architecture of, of these special purpose vehicles uh, secondly the vehicles that emerge are necessarily multi jurisdictional the service Entities, whether it's in banking or the lawyers, etc., who service them are multi-jurisdictional. Um, their capacity to disappear legally um, is is very quick, uh, either in reality or through a fog of of complexity. And then there's a language that accompanies them. Um, typically, the language of commissions, of success, of, of success bonuses, facilitation payments, consultation fees. Uh, you know, and other complex, 
financial instruments. There's a language that bubbles up around these dodgy, the, the dodgier parts of, uh, uh, I call it the pirate sector um, in, 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 this, in this area. Number two, they often fail the, the, you know, the politically exposed person smell test quite early. You know, somebody will pop up, a name will pop up, whether it's South Africa, and any typical South African will say, well, yeah, well, there's something there going on. And, and uh, so you can make a list of of you know of the of the bad guys they they have, they have certain qualities um number 7 uh and finally uh, they're very litigious uh they're very quick to go to court they're very quick to get injunctions uh because they know the weakness of the judicial system just to stop the process long enough for them to complete the transaction um and then they can just walk out or or change into another entity, and by the time the government or you have had elections and the new government is looking for its $1 billion, uh, everything has disappeared into thin air. So when, when, when we look at these uh, entities, they have certain characteristics. Therefore, certain uh, instruments can be created that we can agree on globally, that can be brought to bear on them, uh, just on the basis of their characteristics and uh, bring them under some pressure and, 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 and squeeze some of uh, our tax money out of them. So I want to ask David about the uh, legitimate stuff and tax havens, but just quickly from you, John, because I know you're a former journalist as well. What do you think about this uh, theory that was there a political motivation behind the uh, leak of the Panama Papers, or do you just think it's a massive journalistic scoop? Um, uh, it, 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 it was an extremely, the, the timing was extremely convenient. Um, so questions are asked, but, um, so yes, the questions are asked um, about uh, why this Fonseca company, uh, we know very well that uh, this company is just doing a small fraction of, of the multi-trillion uh, business in in this area. Uh, however, my attitude is that we've got to we've got to work with what we have for now. The motivations of those who have um, uh, um, you know made this league possible are you know I I don't want to spend too much time on that. While I keep in mind, as has been mentioned before, that um, even when we talk of offshore centers where some of these activities are. are moving to uh, it used to be Liechtenstein uh, it is it is the British Virgin Islands it used to be Switzerland but now we're talking about Hong Kong the Seychelles uh, Mauritius uh, Dubai etc so uh, the it's uh, these these entities their capacity to move uh, between jurisdictions uh, means that I'll, 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 I'll take whatever I can get and uh, the Carlos the, the, the Fonseca files the 11.5 million of them uh, thank you very much uh, for whoever did it <laughs> you'll be scar scouring through them for a while uh, David just uh, on that point from ActionAid is there legitimate stuff in tax havens there are kind of schools of thought people who say look it's actually useful for uh, Africa to be able to have places where you can put money beyond reach of corrupt governments, for example. How much weight does that kind of argument hold, do you think, in South Africa today? I, I, I don't think it holds at all. You know, if you want to deal with corrupt governments, the idea is not to find, uh, um, frankly, mostly corrupt uh, jurisdictions to take your your money to. The 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 the, the the, the trick is to deal with uh, reforming corrupt governments, but you know on the on the legitimacy question of, of tax havens activities, just a short anecdote. I remember a, a year or so ago we had been involved as a friend of the court in a big constitutional court case, and and the the, the lawyers representing the chief litigants who won the case against these people who had been, this company that had been aggrieved by by corruption. A, a sponsored a workshop in which they showcased to their clients, and they were entitled to do so, their contribution to combating corruption. And it was very striking to me that when we got to the seminar, on the desk, the brochure that they put on which they advertised their services to their client 
The first service that they showcased was their ability to register companies in such well-known capital-raising jurisdictions as the Seychelles and Mauritius and Dubai. And, you know, the kind of message was that if you're aggrieved by corruption, come to us. But if you want to get your stuff offshore into secrecy jurisdictions, we're your people too. And I, you know, I, it offends me in my soul, I have to say. But I, I, you know, I want to say I don't think that one should fetishize the distinction between uh, uh, illegality and unethical. I feel this about, about corruption generally. When South African uh, politicians uh, accused of the most egregiously unethical conduct uh, puff their chest out and say, we're innocent until proven guilty. It seems to be the one rule of law that every politician has learned. And, and uh, you know, I, I feel about that, that they are to be judged by their ethical uh, positions and not only on a criminal standard. And I feel the same about taxes. And I know that they're more complicated. But aggressive tax avoidance... That, there's a very thin line between aggressive tax avoidance and and illegal tax evasion. And I think aggressive tax avoidance needs to be tackled as well. Of course, there need to be rules and they need to be codified, but they need to be be tackled nonetheless. I, you know, I can understand why the American government is offended by the fact that all the all Apple's uh, um, uh, innovation takes place in California, but all their patents are registered in Ireland, and so they pay tax in Ireland. And recently, I can't remember the names of the companies, but the U.S. somehow contrived to prevent or discourage a merger between two pharmaceutical firms that would have resulted in the big U.S. pharmaceutical firm effectively registering itself in Ireland, where once again it did all its innovation in, in its U.S. home base. And I think there's legitimacy in stopping that. I appreciate that it's got to be done with codified rules and uh, companies have got to know with certainty what will be acceptable and what will, will be unacceptable. But I think we should stop fetishizing the, the distinction between aggressive tax avoidance on the one hand, which is not criminal, and tax evasion, which is criminal. There's no sh sharp line to be drawn to be drawn there in many uh, instances. So just before we go to the next round, just give you a quick chance to answer that, because you were the one who set up this kind of perhaps distinction in the, in the first place. Is that something that what Dave is talking about that you think is, is the way to go? I, I think um, tax, is, tax is a rule of law thing. I think that the, the amount of money that you owe the government needs to be set in rules and I, and I don't think that's I don't think that is a disagreement with David because I think things like aggressive avoidance um, you know in the, in the UK now we have um, the the GAR which is a, a kind of set of rules to deal with that aggressive avoidance but I think um, that I think there is there is still a distinction between um, aggressive avoidance which is uh, you know, trying to sub trying to subvert and get around the rules and things that people may think are unethical. So I mean, I'm not sort of spokesman for David Cameron at all, and I don't know anything about his dealings other than than what I've read. But 50% of people in the UK think that they have said in a survey that they were um, uh, I can't remember what the word it was eth you know ethically um, despicable, and that you know is not in the aggressive avoidance space. It's in the kind of very clearly as set out in the legislation, uh, you know, it, 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 it's not part of that grey area. Mm -hmm. So I think we can say there's a grey area where the law needs to be strengthened, where you can have things like um, uh, r rules against aggressive, aggressive avoidance, but that isn't going to take you as far as, as saying everything that makes, you know, that... that some people feel uncomfortable about um, will be in that space because because it won't and I think and I think we we just need to be be um, clear and and careful on that that yeah. um, you know the the um, recent survey of of 
big companies, um, they, they sort of ask them, you know, what are the things that um, attract you or, or um, turn you away from a country? And one of, the, one of them was tax rates, and that was sort of in there, but it wasn't at the top. But um, in um, uncertainty, tax uncertainty, tax uncertainty was, was mm -hmm. way up there. And so yeah. if you have a system of rules that says, you know, these are the tax rules, but the amount that you um, that you should pay is something else that's not in the rules. You're you're bringing tax uncertainty, and and the, economically the worst kind of um, incentive or tax giveaway to give is one that's uncertain because companies will discount it. If they get it, they'll say thank you very much. It's a windfall, and they'll and they'll you know they'll take it. But okay. it won't, yeah. you know, it won't attract investment because it's uncertain. So maybe some people will pick up on that. But uh, can we have the next round of questions, please? So one at the back there. My name is Paul Griffith. I, I'm a portfolio manager at Bluecrest Capital Management. Um, I, I'm not worried in the least about McDonald's, Microsoft, Starbucks pushing taxes away. Smart governments will deal with that. It's much more the question of the wholesale looting of the African people, right? And, and I was just surprised that, that it really didn't come up until the end of the discussion, which was the role of banks. With, with every single movement, uh, with, with every evasion, with every bad action, with every movement of funds, a bank is involved. And in, in Africa, it might be a small local bank, but by the time it gets to the BVI or wherever else, it's usually a large multinational. And, and there's this concept of KYC, know your customer. And it just seems like that's fallen flat on its face in this situation. And, and so my question is, 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 can't we really just ratchet up? I mean, I mean, banks are screaming bloody murder about more regulation, but this is an area of regulation that seems to be failing mm -hmm. and that needs a lot of work. And, and how can that be remedied? Okay, the lady in the pink jacket. Hi, Angela Devan. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, I'm really interested in this practice of, of undervaluing commodities or, or resources. And you mentioned, uh, Caroline, that after these five major cases, you couldn't even tell if, if it were illegal or not. I wonder if anyone in this room uh, knows of any cases where a company's been sanctioned for doing this. Uh, if it is illegal, is it drawn out in a contract or is it against a country's laws? Uh, I went through a contract today and it it went through all these, uh, you know, provisions that companies have to uh, claim how many carats a diamond is, what grade it is, but nothing about, about money value. Um, and also I have a question for Kevin. Um, there's been talk, I think Vince mentioned that tax harmonization is a taboo. I wonder if you think the same or what you think about suggestions of some sort of international tax monitoring body. Thanks. Okay, and I think there was another one just behind at the back. Hello, my name's Lucy Green. I work for Caroline Flint MP. We're doing quite a bit on tax transparency with the Public Accounts Committee at the moment. Um, I wanted just referring back to David and Meyer's um, kind of discussion around tax avoidance rather than evasion. What the committee thinks on uh, public country by country reporting, particularly in the context of the EU's, uh, the, sorry, the European Commission's um, proposal that was announced last week, whether in principle it's a good thing or whether whether the the Commission's proposals will actually carry any weight and, and, and what can be done around that. Okay. Okay, so shall we take uh, perhaps Caroline on banks? How do we ratchet up the, um, the, the pressure on banks? Um, and perhaps also just this undervaluing of commodities and then Kevin also, if you could answer that one as well. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a really good question about the banks and uh, you're absolutely right, there's been a lot of shaking up of the banks and uh, banking transparency is, is in the process of becoming an issue, shall we say. Um, and certainly the US put a lot of pressure on the Swiss banks, as you will know about, and I think that um, that is an issue that a lot of people are thinking about. Now, I would put in that bucket with the banks, I would put in the accountants and the lawyers, right, because they're all facilitating this, this, whole, this whole issue. This, you know, they're all part of it. 
And they can't say, oh, we don't, we don't know, we're, this is, we're just doing our jobs, because you're absolutely right. Your accountant, your lawyer, your banker, they all should know their clients. So I, I, I think, you know, people have talked about, can we call for regulation of, of these, you know, the law firms, the accounting firms, and what do we do with the banks? So I think it's a, a, an extremely important point. I just, I just want to add also with um, something that's, that's really super important that we really haven't got a handle on but it's linked to these questions, and that is how do we track trade mispricing? Because at the moment we've got this, this number of 38 billion, but we don't really know how much is going out of Africa. We're not quite sure. And it's something the IMF could do. And they've done some estimates, and they actually put them into it. I used to work for the IMF, and they, used to, they, they put it actually in a staff report for Angola. So it's not that it's totally impossible to do. But it should be done on a regular basis, because it would shine a light more on the money that's going out of these countries on a regular basis. So I would really, if I was a lobbyist, which I am actually, but <laughs> and I am lobbying the IMF, but I'd love other people to, to help with that, because somebody needs to get a handle on this figure, and the IMF are best placed to do that. And then I just very quickly want to quote something from Mr. Anand, and this fits into basically what, what David was saying. And he says that tax avoidance and evasion are global issues that affect us all. The impact for G8 countries is a loss of revenue, but in Africa it has a direct impact on the lives of mothers and children. Throughout the world, millions of citizens now need their leaders to step up and take the lead. And I, and I think that that's very, very important because he feels that there isn't leadership on this issue. He complements what David Cameron has done because David Cameron did take leadership and actually I think progress, it's, um, somebody said that there doesn't seem to be much progress. I am overwhelmed by the progress. When, when we started working on this, when Mr. Nunn says, oh, let's look at the tax and you know, transparency issues, everybody said, tax, it's so boring, and nobody wants to do it, it's so boring. It's so not boring now. You know, because it affects us all. We're all bothered by it. It's like everybody's collectively angry about it at one level or another, depending on where you're sitting. So I, I, I think now, I think there's huge progress. The, the beneficial ownership, nobody knew what that, I certainly had no idea what that was when I first started looking at it. But we need journalists like yourself to, to really drill down on these issues. I mean, it was painful for us to get this information with Global Witness. But we need more of it out there. So I think, I think this whole, you know, the, the, the bad valuing of assets is, and the, the plundering of these assets in Africa is something that we need more light shed upon. So I, I, I think this is, a, this is a hugely important issue because it links to all of us. I mean, people say, oh, it's a global issue, but it links to us all. We're all affected. And, and what about the idea that John floated out and also was picked up by the last question about, you know, could there be an international, almost like a UN, like we have for weapons inspections, you know, UN tax inspectors to kind of go in and do proper audits, you know, a, a much higher level of international scrutiny. Well, I mean, the, the OECD have got this thing called Tax Inspectors Without Borders, um, but we would certainly say that whatever the OEC does, it shouldn't just be a discussion amongst OEC, the OECD, it should be a discussion globally. So sometimes the OECD have a little discussion and then Africa gets brought in at the end. So I think John's absolutely right. There has to be something that connects these issues together at the, at the international level. And I think that's why Mr. Nan is calling for, the, for this, lo this kind of global leadership. Mr. John's pretty sad. John, you wanted to come in at, at this point? Yes, I, I, just, I just wanted to add uh, just, just a point to riding on the question that was just asked about the involvement of the banks and the auditing firms. I think this is absolutely critical. And the irony is that uh, the regulations and legislation and everything exists already uh, to ensure uh, compliance in this area. And anecdotally, from my experience, when one wants to to engage in large-scale corrupt activities, you don't go to the small banks. You go to the you know the bigger the deal, the bigger the the, the corrupt deal, the bigger the bank you go to. Um, that's because they, they'll do it well for you. 
um, you go to the, the, the bigger the auditing firm, the bigger the, the law firm. That's the reality on the ground. You, you don't go to the small bank, they're going to get caught, they, they're exposed, they don't have the political connections. You go to the big banks. So we, 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 have, a, we have a light touch compliance environment around the banking sector that, that is quite troubling and uh, is very enabling in terms of allowing some of the uh, challenges that we're discussing here uh, to be facilitated uh, between developing and developed countries. And Kevin, just on this point of undervaluing commodities, you looked at that quite a lot. Um, how prevalent is it? What, what sort of sense of, you know, just how much was this seen as a common business practice in certain countries, just something that got done? Well, look, the... the Global authority on this is not me, but it, it's Daniel Bannon-Curtis who's sitting right over there. So grab him over a glass of wine before he gets it. He's actually what writing... Do you think? Well, look, I'm saying a bit about the, the question of illegality. I mean, a lot of these deals are grossly, clearly grossly illegal. Um, is this on? Yeah, so if you look at the BSGR, the uh, Benny Steinmetz Group Resources deal, uh, we actually got co copies of the contracts that he, he, his company and his agents signed with the wife of the dictator of Guinea at the time, promising her uh, a stake in the mine if she helped take it away from another company and give it to them. Um, so it's clearly illegal, and we've said, we've, said, we've said as much, and they managed to do this by registering companies in the British Virgin Islands that are secretly owned by the wife of the president. And then they claim that they've got nothing whatsoever to do with them. That there's another British Virgin Island company that's channeling some of the bribe money. And they say, oh, it's nothing to do with us. And then we get more documents showing it was another company linked to Benny Steinmetz Group Resources that set up that British Virgin Island company. And they say, oh, but that's nothing to do with us as well. And they just put in place these shields and they use agents. And it's all about distancing themselves from the bribery that happens. But if you, if you look and if you're lucky enough to get the leaks and speak to the right people, you, you, know, you, you find out that the, the company officials, the highest company officials, are often intimately linked with the bribery that happens. So a lot of it's um, illegal. You look at the stuff that's happening in, in Congo, the, the $1.4 billion that went missing. Those deals are currently the subject of criminal investigation. It's one of the serious fraud officers' most important cases. Most important, I say, because it involves grand corruption, the looting of an entire nation. Um, that's under a criminal investigation now, and, and I hope that it, that it reaches um, a conclusion and they find out what goes on. It's also the subject of criminal investigation in America because a hedge fund involved, OXIF, is being investigated. So, um, so then we'll find out. We'll, we'll, we'll find out what the conclusion of all this is over the course of time. If I, could, if I could just make a couple mm -hmm. of points there. I, I mean, I do think Global Witness, and I'm not saying this because Daniel's here, have played a completely extraordinary role in this. But it's also illustrative of part of the problem because the reporting system that Vince was describing was a big breakthrough in concept. But in implementation, what we've now had is three years of polite dialogue with the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, and others who are driving a coach and horses through the spirit and intent of the legislation. And we're having this very partial exchange that, you know, we might share some of this information on terms that we define as appropriate to your criminal investigation agency if you can give us evidence that person X might be involved. So what do we do to change that? Well, what we do to change it is that the, the victims of, the, of these crimes are the people that Daniel is describing. The, these are people in Africa who have been deprived of health and education because of grand theft. And you can call it something else, but, it, but it's grand theft. And you need an investigatory capacity. You know, glo global or... witness multiplied by mm. 300. You need it in country and you need it internationally. You need both. And I, I think you can't have one or the other. And if you don't have it in country, you can't mobilize the domestic forces for change. I mean, Pakistan's a prime example of this. You know, this is a country with the lowest, I think I'm right in saying, I've got colleagues here who will probably correct me publicly if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think I'm right in saying that Pakistan has the lowest tax to GDP ratio in the world. It's, it's something like 8%, some, something of that order. There was a report that came out two years ago from, I can't remember the group, it's the Pakistani Committee of Investigative Journalists. Um, 
that documented the fact that 80% of the cabinet hadn't filled in a tax form for five years, including the prime minister. Now, you know, is it a surprise that they end up in these documents? No, but you know, but you know, it's so difficult to have these debates in the absence of of, of real information. C can I just quick other point? Well, look, the 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 other point I, I was going to make was on this tax harmonisation. Yes. And the, the, the issue there is at the moment we're going in precisely the opposite direction. We're in race to the bottom mm -hmm. territory and everyone's falling each other over, uh, over each other to sort of grab little bits of investment on the belief that you need to incentivise investors by cutting their tax rate. You know, everything we know about this is wrong. You know, that, that, that's actually not what attracts investment. I, I think moving towards a harmonised global system is actually not really on the agenda at the moment. But what has to be on the agenda is, I think, a full frontal attack on this aggressive tax planning. And the, you know, an egregious example of that, which is in the Panama Papers, which I think people haven't sufficiently picked up, is a heritage oil company that generates a 400 million capital gain in a company that's registered in Bermuda, then shifts the company to Mauritius because Mauritius has an agreement that the, uh, because Mauritius doesn't have a capital gains tax. Okay, but as Vince was pointing out, if you change the rules in those countries, what is happening is specks or cold islands on coral reefs set themselves up as a, a as a tax haven. How do you how do you avoid the the ruling nature of this? You, you know, I, I think it's difficult to buy that. I mean, governments are not powerless. You, you know, the, the, these are powerful. The UK government is a powerful entity. You know, it's not about sending gunboats. You, you, this should this is a direct this should be a direct taxation rule issue. You know, the U.S. could deal with Delaware tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could deal with Hong Kong. I mean, this is I think it's a non-argument to be honest okay. with you. I just want to because we're running very close to time. I just want to pick up this last point, which was the country by country reporting that you asked. Maya, do you do you have some thoughts on that? Would that make a difference? Um, I I think it wouldn't. It's not designed to make a difference to this issue that we're talking about, about secrecy. It's designed for, for a different issue. It's designed for um, the, the question of our companies um, paying the fair amount of tax and in, in the public view and um, as a, a, a sort of um, risk assessment uh, extra piece of information for the for the tax officials to judge whether um, whether the transfer prices that they're setting uh, are right um, that you know that in theory is what it's for I, I'm I'm not sure how it will work I, I I'm not sure that whether it will create a lot more a lot more noise and whether it will create any more insight um, I think there are um, uh, I think, to, you know, there, there's been um, uh, country by country and possibly, you know, potentially project by project reporting around extractives, and I think that's really interesting. And and also the kind of open contracts around extractives in terms of um, how do we understand whether a deal is a good deal, which is separate from the question of so, so separate from the question someone if that. someone is. You know, is someone stealing the money is a separate question from is this a good deal for the country and have we made the right decision in terms of taking the money early or taking the money late and you know why why has the deal been set up in this way and that's quite that's a complicated question um, and I think it, you know we're, we're going to start getting a lot more data coming out and the challenge is how do we understand it how do we translate from that data into real um, real understanding and, and sort of serious discussions about it and not just, okay. uh, you know, kind of headlines. So that, that's a good thought to wrap up on. Uh, just as we're running out of time, I do want to bring in um, David and John, who've stayed up late for us in uh, South Africa and Kenya. Can I just ask you, if you had two things that you'd like to see come out of the Panama paper revelations, what would they be? John, first to you and then to David. I think uh, two things. Number one, 
is to see a sustained level of attention and outrage and anger around these issues and the kind of devastating impact they have on developing economies. If, 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 if this information, as more and more of it becomes uh, available and more forensic analysis is done, that these, these issues become clear to people that uh, how much damage is being done, I think that would be very helpful for, 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 for humanity, for us to know that this kind of damage is done. If then, secondly, we can move on to a situation where we are courageous enough to think of uh, an international instrument or instruments that allow us to deal with the most egregious offenses in this area in a direct and powerful way, um, I think that would be a very, very positive development. Just taking action on a few egregious cases will in itself have an important, important demonstrative effect. Okay, and David, from you, two top things you'd like to see come out of the Panama Papers? Yeah, I, I think uh, um, a focus on the regulation of intermediaries like law firms, and a couple of people have mentioned that here. I think the, these, the facilitators of illicit flows, and they range from, from big banks to uh, real estate agents. I think they need to be uh, regulated much more firmly. And then I think like John, as I think John was saying, I'd really like to see a couple of big trials come out of this, you know. There's nothing that concentrates the mind then better than a few uh, seriously rich people going to jail over these kind of things. And I'm sure that that material and evidence is probably contained in those, uh, in those papers when they're, uh, when they're more deeply interrogated. Okay. And Kevin, Caroline, one thing you'd like to come out, because we're out of time. Well, I'll give you one. I mean, since we're so concerned about the ability of governments to act on this, like, how about if companies that choose to do business from the British Virgin Islands or the Cayman Islands or other could be blacklisted territories are penalised for doing so in the market and banks are penalised for dealing with them. Okay. And I, I would just like to raise one very quick point. When we spoke to mining companies about these issues, um, they turned around and they surprised us and they said, no, we want beneficial ownership registries to be open because we want to know who we're dealing with. So I think we have to push that. Right. Everybody thinks the companies and the mining, they're all evil and they don't know that's not the case. So we have more people on our side than we think, which would really help us push for these multilateral standards. We, you know, it's very important to know who wants what. And I would love to see change in the US. Obama's pushing for it. It's got to happen at the state level. I would love to see that. Amaya, one thing you'd like to see come out of the Panama Papers? Um, I'd like to see, um, as, sort of as, as Caroline said, that the recognition that, that dealing with corruption is not a kind of business versus the world. You know, it, it's a it's an, it's a win-win for for legitimate businesses. And for and for people and for, and for governments, and the, I think there's a lot more common ground than than people think there is. And I think kind of finding those areas um, and the and the specific um, changes that can be made, mm -hmm. I think, is would be a really positive thing. Okay, so I'd just like at this point to say thank you very much to the panel, to David and to John in Africa, uh, South Africa and Kenya respectively, for staying up late and uh, really helping to inform this conversation with the view from the continent. Kevin Watkins, Caroline Kendo, Rob, Maya, thank you very much indeed for the conversation. And don't stop the conversation here. We have some drinks and some nibbles, I've been told to say, outside. So thank you very much and um, thanks to our panel.